place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Has also changed a great deal during that time. So this is the first of a series of panel discussions that we will be hosting inspired by the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Portland downtown plan. Within that plan, PSU was designated an urban university. Shorthand for urban university, a university that is in and of its place. The university and others in its place share a fate. We are in it together. So the downtown plan happened, of course, before I came here, but I was aware of it and aware of many other innovations in the world of planning that had occurred during the 1970s. And it was one of the major attractions for me to come to this place where planning was taken as seriously as it was. So this is of course a very, very important time to consider, we are considering the future of our university and the future of our place. And so the panels will focus in some cases on PSU as an urban university, and in other cases on what's happening in our place. With an eye toward, given the 50 years experience that we've had with the downtown plan, given 50 years of PSU as an urban university, what's the future? What ought the future to be like? So we have a distinguished panel here today. Uh, I'll begin by introducing the panel. And then Ethan Seltzer, who was going to be moderator of this session, but who is unfortunately unable to join us in person, will talk about a paper, a paper analyzing the evolution of the notion of an urban university and of PSU as an urban university. So if you haven't gotten a, uh, a copy of that paper, it's available on the website that accompanies this set of panels. And you can also write directly to me and I'll get you a copy of the paper. Before we start on uh, the panel, I'm welcoming, I'm welcoming you also to this space. This is the first event that we are having in our remodeled Dursay Moroni Toulon Library. It's a work in progress. We still have some finishing to do. We still need to get things on the wall and into cabinets. So that'll be ongoing. The remodeling of the library was made possible in large part by a generous gift from Toulon family members. And what'll happen after we are done with the set of panels is that the library will be available to students as workspace. And we ho also hope to host additional events in this place. So first a set of thank yous about the library to Sarah Violante in the Dean's office who has overseen the transformation of this space, a tremendous piece of work. And also, in addition to Sarah Violante, the other staff members in the Dean's office, Kaya Mendoza, Aaron Sutherland, and Jonathan Wolf, who are responsible for enabling us to put on this event, both in person and virtually. So again, I'll introduce panels. Ethan will speak. Panel, make, uh, panel members will make presentations. 
Then panel members will discuss things among themselves. And when they've had enough of that, we'll open up both the floor and to those zooming in the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. For those who are Zooming, let us know that you want to ask a question, and then you will be able to unmute yourself so you can talk to all of us. OK, distinguished panel members. Uh, first, Judith Ramaley. Now, most of you, I'm sure, know Judith as a member of our board of trustees and as former president of Portland State during the 1990s. And Judith was playing the leadership role in the evolution of PSU as an urban university, much of which we treasure about Portland State today initially manifests during her term in office. Let knowledge serve the city. Model that was crafted when Judith was in the role and I think continues to define Portland State as an urban university. We construe the city broadly. We live in an urban world. But as a result of the innovations that were put in place when Judith was president, PSU emerged on both a national and an international stage as an exemplar of what an urban university ought to be like. So it's a great pleasure to have Judith on our panel today to talk about that, to reflect on the paper that was written by urban studies doctoral student Kimberly Nightingale and Professor Emeritus of Urban Studies and Planning, Ethan Seltzer. Uh, Lisa Bates, Professor of Urban Studies and Planning and of Black Studies. She is also the Portland Professor of Innovative Housing Policy. Lisa is doing very, very substantial things both on and off campus that relate directly to knowledge serving and co-creating knowledge. Her research and practice in our region was recognized with the Urban Affairs Association Marilyn J. Gittell Activist Scholar Award. And she's doing a great deal in the arts sector as well. Professor Richard Klukas, Professor of Political Science and Executive Director of the Western Political Science Association, nation's second largest regional political association, political science association, excuse me. He's written extensively about state and local politics, especially about Oregon also coordinates the political science department's internship program, which places students in city, county, nonprofit, and other offices. He's long been a catalyst for co collaborative work on governance in Oregon, most recently has turned his attention to the arts, arts organizations, and their roles in our community. Okay, Ethan Seltzer is gonna start with a few words and a few words about Ethan. Ethan recently retired from Portland State after an extensive career, both within the university, but also outside of it, working in several local and regional organizations, City of Portland, Metro, as an advocate in the environmental sector, and as a faculty member in Urban Studies and Planning and founding director of the Institute for Portland Metropolitan Studies, one of the leading examples of PSU's emergence as an urban university.
Ethan, please get us started. Okay, thank you, Sai. Uh, can everybody hear me? And if you can, I can't see you, but you know, wave your hands or something or snap your fingers. Excellent. Okay, yeah, thank you, Matthew. Good to see you. <laughs> Excellent. We have a quite a group with us online, by the way, for those of you who are in the room, and it's good to see everyone uh, this morning. So um, yeah, let me start first by saying that um, the paper I'm going to talk about, I wrote with Kimberly Nightingale, one of our urban studies and planning uh, PhD students. She's fantastic. Um, and if anybody is looking for an amazing uh, graduate assistant, uh, you really ought to uh, talk to Kimberly at some point soon. Um, OK, uh, 1972, the downtown plan, probably one of the most um, consequential plans in the city of Portland's history. Um, as the 50th anniversary was kind of coming into view, um, Sai and I were talking about, well, what could we do to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that plan? In 1997, we had a pretty extensive celebration of the physical accomplishments of that plan, where we looked uh, in some detail at uh, what actually happened on the ground, because it was and is pretty remarkable. Um, so we didn't need to do that again. The question became, well, what, what should we, what could we do this time? Um, and in reading the plan, uh, I came across this phrase that Portland State, it's a goal actually in the plan, that Portland State should be an urban university. By this free phrase, we intend to imply far more than a fact of location. We believe that PSU and the city should be consciously aware of, take advantage of, and in fact, emphasize their impact on each other. Well, this language brought me up short because um, as Sai mentioned, uh, I really uh, kind of got most engaged with Portland State as it was uh, consciously adopting its identity as an urban university uh, and its urban mission through the strategic plan that Judith had initiated back in 1991. Um, and my a naive and uninformed kind of sense was that that was when Portland State became an urban university. But lo and behold, here was this thing from 1972 calling out Portland State as an urban university, uh, kind of like you know something that falls into a crevasse on a glacier, and you know thousands of years later, as the glacier melts, reappears again. And I went, wow, where did this come from? Uh, who did this? Um, how did that language get there? And so. Um, what we decided to do was look at that history of Portland State as an urban university, and in particular, how it was that these words um, ended up in the 1972 downtown plan. So I want to say that um, for those of you in Portland who are interested in these kinds of historical questions, we have amazing people working in the PSU library with the uh, PSU archives and special collections. These are really talented people who can dig on your behalf like you'll never believe. We also have very talented people working right across the urban plaza in the uh, city of Portland archives who uh, can similarly do uh, magical things um, in terms of kind of discovering, you know, why is it or where is it that these things came from? Why, um, why do they exist? So I got I to gotta say that uh, we benefited greatly from the expertise that was all around us. Um, we wanted to ask a couple of questions. First, where did this idea of the urban university in the US come from? How far back does that go? Uh, second, uh, what do we know about the history of PSU as an urban university explicitly, not just as a place located in a city, but a place, as Sai said, which is really of the city? Um, and third, what might that mean for how we look forward? Uh, because um, anniversaries are tricky things, you know? Um, it's great to have a 50th anniversary. Uh, some things are timeless. Um, it's great, you know, for example, to celebrate the, uh, your 50th birthday or the 50th anniversary of a marriage. Um, but, uh, you know, other anniversaries are kind of more rooted in their context. They're a little trickier to interpret 50 years on. Um, and so uh, as a consequence, what we'd really like to do with with what we're gonna talk about today is think less about what does 50 years ago mean and much more what does 50 years from now mean and uh, how do we take these ideas forward? Okay, 
So first, the urban university idea in the United States. Um, you know, a lot of us kind of think about um, land grant universities uh, when we think about um, urban universities. And land grant universities arose in the 19th century um, as it became apparent that the rural population of the expanding United States was not going to be able to travel to uh, more traditional universities. Um, and furthermore, that those inclined to get a college education um, in rural areas um, were essentially being extracted uh, from those rural areas, just like the natural resources that existed out there and the brain drain uh, was phenomenal. And so the idea behind land grant universities was that um, it was a way to bring higher education to where people were and to connect it both to providing access to higher education as well as to um, using the benefits of research, uh, university research and, and knowledge creation to help bolster rural economies and rural communities. Well, similarly, um, the US went through uh, dramatic urbanization in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, keep in mind that world cities like Paris and Rome and London took millennia to become a million people. But Chicago and New York grew to several million people in less than 100 years. It was astonishing. It's, it, it was a, a it kind of shocked the world um, how quickly these cities were growing. Um, and uh, as a consequence, as the US population grew and became, in fact, um, progressively urban and rapidly urban, uh, two things happened. One, uh, we were confronted with a whole new set of urban issues. Um, the issues of rapidly urbanizing places became uh, U.S. issues at an early point in the 20th century. Um, and we also became confronted with the same issues in many ways that land-grant universities were confronted with. Namely, how could urban populations get access to this primarily formally elite uh, institution known as higher education? Um, how could they further their learning and careers? And furthermore, how could those universities um, especially tangibly contribute to the development of cities and to the resolution of the urban problems that were emerging? So in actual fact, the notion of an urban university um, took formal uh, kind of became a formal uh, term uh, in 1914 with the creation of the Association of Urban Universities uh, in the United States. Um, a combination actually of, of, uh, of universities, which in fact were very place bound and understood themselves in the context of their cities um, and universities, which you know historically had kind of ended up in cities and had had grown there kind of anyway. But um, suffice it to say that the Association of Urban Universities beginning in 1914 uh, began to hold conferences and talk about uh, urban universities and what it could mean um, uh, in the years ahead as this nation uh, confronted its urban issues. Um, the other thing about the urban university idea that emerged early in the 20th century, uh, that it was a mechanism really for universities to create a distinctive brand. Uh, that is, uh, uh, to kind of identify and highlight a distinctive role uh, for universities like Portland State, um, which didn't exist then, but others, uh, and as a way of contrasting them starkly with their land grant cousins. So it was a way of establishing a, a role and a foothold in the higher education market, for lack of a better word, um, for universities that began to identify them with their urban places. Um, of course, what we had uh, in the first part of the 20th century was uh, uh, kind of a period of rapid growth followed by the Great Depression, followed by World War II, meaning that uh, for the first half of the 20th century, um, we saw the emergence of the urban university idea, and then we saw the um, kind of essentially um, stalling of urbanization um, as events uh, overtook cities in the nation um, for uh, a period of several decades. But after uh, World War II um, and into the 1950s, um, the uh, urbanization occurred uh, at an even more rapid clip. 
uh, accompanied by rapid white flight and suburbanization, uh, all of which began to um, create a whole new set of issues that became referred to as the urban crisis, where it wasn't just a question of how to make urban areas work better. It was, you know, what was the future for cities themselves? Would future would the city have a future in a rapidly suburbanizing United States? Um, what was that kind of going to look like? Um, and so several uh, discussions began to take place. One, of course, was the ongoing urban university discussion. The other was the emergence of an idea in the late 50s and 60s of what were called urban grant universities. And the idea with the urban grant university was that like land grants, uh, the urban grant university would be funded to provide access for the urban population to higher education and to connect the products of research uh, within universities to solving uh, the present and emerging uh, urban issues um, confronting cities throughout the United States. Um, land grant universities, of course, were funded by the provision of large amounts of land. Uh, that was not uh, in the cards for urban grant universities um, in the latter half of the 20th century. And the expectation was that the federal government would actually make direct cash grants uh, to create urban grant universities across the country. Um, federal legislation to create urban grant universities actually was passed in 1979 and again in 1987, uh, but no funds were ever actually allocated to create the urban grants. And as a consequence, that idea faded uh, pretty quickly. Today, what we know of as an urban university can be defined according to about five key uh, factors. First, located in a city or metropolitan region, uh, both physically, but also in the minds of its students, staff, and faculty. Um, these are places, as Sai mentioned, of their place. It's kind of an interesting thing for a university to be connected explicitly uh, to the place that it's in. Uh, second, that they're committed to providing urban residents with access to higher education. Uh, higher education in places where people live, work, socialize, have family and friends. Uh, not everybody can kind of travel off to a four-year institution uh, in, a, um, in, in a pastoral setting. Uh, it's a wonderful thing if you can pull it off, but it's just simply not the cards for, for too many households. Um, third, that um, the urban university is aware of the conflicting aims of on one hand, a research university, and on the other, uh, an urban university, meaning that urban universities to succeed have to have explicit awards and, and incentives uh, throughout its operation and uh, promotion and tenure guidelines and, and uh, you know, kind of from A to Z uh, within the university to ensure that the urban university mesh, mission uh, is enmeshed in everything the university is engaged in. Um, fourth, that the curriculum itself uh, demonstrates a high degree of interdisciplinarity. Um, what do we mean by this? Well, what we mean is that only in the university are urban problems described in terms of disciplines. Uh, what does a political scientist think? What does an economist think? What does a geographer think? What does a physicist think? Um, because the way that most of us experience cities and the way that most problems emerge in cities, uh, they emerge um, not defined by disciplines, but actually as a, as a kind of an integral thing, as something with a, a kind of a holism of its own, um, best addressed through not separating the disciplines from each other, but by bringing the disciplines together. And then fifth, um, that an urban university is fundamentally organized around integrating urban community needs and aspirations into teaching, research, and service activities, um, and wherever possible, carrying out those activities through partnerships that cross boundaries, both between the university and the community, but within the community itself. Uh, our community is essentially populated by institutions whose boundaries were established at one point and which now we live with. Um, what's the difference between uh, the city of Portland and North unincorporated urban Clackamas County? And the answer is, it depends on what side of Clatsop Street you're on. 
Um, and uh, in many ways, I think that's emblematic of the way in which what we do in the urban university, how we do it, has got to be adept at crossing boundaries. Now, the emergence of PSU, let's move on to kind of how PSU became an urban university, was framed by this thinking. You know, Portland State was started as the Portland Extension Center in 1946 um, for, uh, by the chancellor's office in uh, uh, the state of Oregon. The chancellor used to be a very powerful office, uh, which essentially oversaw higher education in the state of Oregon. Um, and it was created as a means for um, serving returning GIs coming to Portland, uh, coming home to Portland, getting jobs, having families, and needing higher education where they lived. Um, but it was not without controversy. Uh, University of Oregon and at the time Oregon State College were both very wary of the creation of an institution of higher education in Portland because they viewed it as a competitor uh, for both attention and resources um, that they uh, viewed as ne necessary to their own existence. Um, but um, by asserting that its primary function was serving uh, people who were place bound um, and serving the community that it was in, uh, the extension center was essentially given the room to begin to grow. Um, it attracted some remarkable people who provided tremendous leadership um, so that by 1955, the case was persuasively made to the legislature that um, Portland Extension Center should become Portland State College and continue with its work as the urban university um, for the state of Oregon, and in particular for the Portland metropolitan region. Now, this was not an easy thing to do. This was a, a, a a closely fought political battle. Um, and it continued on uh, afterwards. The chancellor's office um, ensured that Portland State had, or Portland State College at that point, had very little control over its curriculum and uh, its degrees, that they were all couched in terms of how they did or did not conflict with offerings at Oregon State College and at the University of Oregon. Um, but at the same time, there was a growing relationship between Portland State and its community. And I think it's exemplified uh, in 1962 by a letter from then Mayor Terry Schrunk to the Chancellor of Higher Education in Oregon, asking that the Chancellor and the, and, and the, uh, uh, the State Board of Education create um, a planning program at Portland State College. Uh, Mayor Schrunk noted that there were only two graduate planning programs on the West Coast at the time, one at Berkeley and the other at University of Washington, that the people trained in those programs um, had no interest really in moving from the Bay Area or from Seattle respectively, um, and that as a consequence, Portland had to train its own planners if the city were going to get access to the planning talent uh, that it needed. And so Mayor Schrunk asked that the chancellor immediately move forward to create a planning program at Portland State College. Now this was at a time when Portland State College was trying to make the case that it too ought to have graduate programs. Um, and in fact, the first two graduate programs that got established at Portland State College were in social work and in urban studies. Um, but the interesting thing about this 1962 letter from Mayor Schrunk is that uh, it went to the chancellor in January. Um, within a week, um, not only had Port the, the leadership at Portland State College contacted the chancellor and explained that, oh yes, they were uh, ready to help out in whatever way they could, um, but the response had gone from the chancellor back to the city. Now this is within a week 1962, we're, we're talking no internet, we're talking no email, we're talking no texting, uh, we're talking actually pretty crappy telephone service. Um, this is the movement of letters in the US mail. Um, all of this to say that this was a remarkable and rapid response, which suggests I think pretty clearly that indeed uh, the leadership of Portland State College had become embedded in the city of Portland and were working closely uh, with their colleagues at the city of Portland at that time to advance 
both the interests of the city and the interests of Portland State University. It took until 1969 for Portland State College to become Portland State University. Um, and then it was just several short years later that the urban university idea is presented in the 1972 downtown plan. But all of this to say that the idea of the urban university was um, very much uh, baked into Portland State University and the idea of Portland State from its very inception. Uh, the idea that Portland State would distinguish itself um, from Oregon State College, now Oregon State University and the University of Oregon by being an urban university and this classical kind of notion of urban university, the extent you could call anything classical that kind of emerged you know, in fits and starts in the 20th century. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that this was part of how Portland State strategically advanced uh, and grew and evolved in the context of what would essentially was a relatively hostile uh, institutional environment uh, throughout the rest of the state of Oregon. But I think this sets up um, an interesting kind of challenge for us today um, because it allows us to uh, understand ourselves as fundamentally an urban university at our core. Um, and it allows us to ask some very interesting questions like, um, how should the urban university idea shape Portland State in the future? And how will that change, how will that idea change or accentuate uh, aspects of the institution that we know today? Um, and again, kind of two really important contextual parts for this. One, of course, is that we're on the cusp of hiring a new leader for Portland State University. Uh, the second is that uh, due to the pandemic, of which I am a direct participant in at this point in time, um, we're asking some really fundamental questions now about what's the future of the workplace and what's the future of downtown. Uh, it's in part a real estate question, but it's much more than a real estate question because it really gets at the heart of how we will join together uh, to come up with new ideas, create new knowledge, uh, and essentially build the economy uh, that we're gonna have uh, in the 21st century and beyond. So that's where I'm gonna start. Um, there's a lot more in the paper. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me, but I'm gonna turn it back to Sai. And thanks to our panelists, uh, really appreciate your presence here this morning. Ethan, thanks very, very much. Okay, Judith, please tell us what you think. Tell you what I think. <laughs> Good. Uh, Ethan has edits up uh, really well. Uh, our focus really now is on our future as an urban university, but also on the challenges confronting us and our region, especially Portland. And that's what has shaped urban institutions from the beginning. And it started its back in the, the turn of the last century and led us through to today. I, I loved reading the 1972 downtown plan. It described Portland both the economic, cultural, and social center of a dynamic region, which was a nice way to say we were a mess. <laughs> the plan uh, itself, however, and over the next 25 years, the action it's at in motion, according to the uh, report 25 years later made us quote an international icon for central city discovery that's what set me off was recovery um, so it's time for another period of central city recovery this time aided by a university that has matured, that is deeply committed to community engagement, and at the same time, 
in extraordinary need of recovery ourselves in a variety of ways. So while the use of space and the infrastructure of downtown are still issues as they were in 1972, we need a new recovery plan that will address certainly continuing infrastructure questions, but also the most challenging social issues, the impact of changing economic and environment questions, and of course, the wreckage created by the pandemic. So our own fortunes rise and they fall with the city. And we are, I discovered last week at a board meeting, uh, represent 19% of downtown. That's a lot of downtown. So what challenges face the city? Uh, all three of us will shortly have ways of talking about that. But there are wrenching changes in the third place and emptying of offices downtown due to a shift into a hybrid model of doing business, which started during the pandemic, but has become clear to many workers of all kinds that it actually makes sense for life balance, work balance. Secondly, it's taking a while to return to the vibrant social, cultural lives of downtown. The number of businesses that have gone under, the number of restaurants that have gone out of business, the increase in graffiti on those abandoned sites. There's also growing fear about the safety of downtown as violence increases a serious shortage of affordable housing, which I suspect Professor Bates will speak to on other things. Um, sharp differences in the impact of both climate change and other factors on different neighborhoods throughout the city and a growing presence of social injustice and a continuing lack of access to green space, health care, sources of healthy food, healthy opportunities for people, transportation in different pockets around the region. We also have a growing diversity in our population, which we have not yet figured out how to see as an incredible resource and asset. We see it as a problem to solve. I don't mean we at Portland State, but people in the region. How does that connect to challenges at Portland State? Well, as I said, we rise and fall with Portland. The composition of our own student body beautifully reflects that of the region. One of the definitions of an urban grant university back in the days of the higher ed act was the proportion of students that came from the region, which in our case is huge, two thirds of the undergraduates who come here studied at Portland Community College or one of the other areas. They are from this community, of this community engaged in this community just the way we are. And the more we engage those students in our work, the better it's going to be for its future. Our graduation rates have been slowly climbing, but not fast enough. Um, as our student body becomes more diverse, we're having a terrible time attracting a BIPOC professional community to work with them. Like many of our peers, we 
face challenges due to both regional and national demographics and changing perceptions of the value of education. We are deeply embedded in the metro region, so it's not surprising that the significant disruptions in the city of Portland brought on by the pandemic affect us, our reputation. So we need to work very closely with elected officials, business community, BIPOC communities all over the region, the nonprofit sector and others to address these things. And Professor Clickus will probably lead us into quite a discussion of politics. At least I hope so. I plan to take notes. But so what can we do? to contribute to the city and the region now. Unlike 1972, we are so much part of the region and our problems are both intertwined with those of our neighbors and at the same time informed by and influenced by them. So what might be our shared aspirations for the future, both of the downtown or inner city, and for ourselves as urban universities. I'm just beginning to think through that, and sitting on this panel has helped me spend a little more time doing so than I might otherwise. What roles can we play in helping? aspirations of a healthy downtown come into being. We've heard some of that with Ethan, and I'll repeat it because it's still true. The educational experiences we offer to people, in our case, of all ages, at all stages of life, with very different life experiences that they bring to their education. And the programs that provide those experiences, we're constantly adapting our curriculum, thinking differently about the student experience. Second, our capacity to respond to the changing needs and interests of our students, the people who live and work in our region and are already our community partners, even though they're students here. So the relationship is very different from a traditional university. Third, we are truly community engaged, but how can we adapt our approaches both to community-based learning and curriculum, our approach to scholarship and research, and to community engagement itself, as well as how work is done in collaboration with members of the community. Our approach to community engagement has been changing dramatically over the past decade. And I'm not sure how many of us realize how much it is changing and what that could mean. And finally, the themes within our scholarship, our ability to study complex, what I like to call wicked problems, and to work with others to answer critical questions about the challenges and opportunities we face. Uh, I was pleased to hear Ethan talk about the difference between a discipline and multidiscipline, because the approach we increasingly need to take does not define the world through a particular disciplinary lens. It's going to require thinking in very new ways about complex problems that can be understood and addressed through many different lenses. So we have opportunities in our downtown as well as metropolitan region that are not only essential to our own health and well-being, but to everybody else's. So the opportunity to review the 1972 plan, 
to unpack and rethink what triggered it, what role was expected from what was then a very young, yet to be proven institution, takes a new dimension now, a dimension of incredible importance. So thank you for being here today, thinking deep thoughts with us and arguing if you feel like it. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to join this panel. So I came to the Taiwan School in 2009, so definitely in, in the more mature phase of Portland State as an urban, <laughs> as an urban university. Um, and I felt really happy to come here um, to a university that is, you know, seen kind of as a, as a member of the community, as a part of the community, or even, even kind of like part of the family um, in the way that um your your family member can be like kind of problematic sometimes but it's also um beloved and you know you have your ups and downs in the relationship but the the presence is is always there um and i think you know much like in a family sometimes our our stories about ourselves are a little glossed over or exaggerated but um you know since because we are always here and we are committed to being here we always also have room to grow together to repair and to evolve our relationships um, and that's definitely what I've experienced here at the family, as a faculty member, uh, both individually in my work in the community and also kind of as a representative of the institution um, in the community. And so thinking about kind of the evolution as we go forward is where I um, took my starting point in thinking about um, what I would bring today. How would we look like into the future as PSU, as a place, um, as a university in a place, of a place, with a place? Um, so I'm glad, uh, Sai, that you mentioned that, uh, my art practice. Um, it's something for me, it's a method of inquiry and it's a way to engage in cultural organizing through an imaginative practice. And so, you know, urban planning, I'm an urban planner by um, training, I guess, by education, but um, also a human being. <laughs> and, you know, we're all, we're future oriented, um, but I think it's really helpful in our work to try to develop a more um, imaginative practice and a more speculative practice about where we're going to go into the future. And so I picked that up from, you know, like the sci-fi writer Octavia Butler, who talks about building her worlds by looking at where we are today and asking what next and what if um, from our today's trends and emerging issues. And also from my friend and colleague in Black Studies, Walida Amarisha, um, who challenges us to use a visionary style to um to you know build these worlds to point to the possibilities for choices and for action to both illuminate the destination that we're trying to reach and then also shed some light on the pathways that will bring us there um so i was really thinking about what is this next 50 years of portland downtown with portland state university here where we are so 2072 as she approaches the eye scan at the urban center door Julie nods to the armored vehicle parked outside. Its presence makes her feel safe, even though she can't see inside its mirrored tint windows. I guess it might even be empty, she muses, but it's quickly snapped into attention by the late, late, late flashing light as the door unlocks. If you do not pay your balance in one week, access will be denied. A loud voice announces as her photo and tuition due are flashed on a big screen. So embarrassing. Julie could have stayed home for class anyway, but after fighting with her parents about going to Portland State and coming to downtown, she felt like she needed to keep making the point. She plugs into one of the class pods, 100 students on laptops with another 500 remotely tuned in. Class is taught by a part-timer beaming in from two states away, so it really doesn't matter if she comes in or not. But now Julie has the front chance to meet her friends for lunch. She crosses the street in the elevated walkway, more scans on the way into the glassed-in corridor, and notices that below, a person who didn't pass the scan is being folded into the back of the armored car by security forces. Well, that answers that question. At least they're not resisting, Julie thinks. That can get ugly. The student center is set up as a food cart pod. She learned about those in history class, but it's way too smoky to eat outside for most of the year. Everything at the university is now connected either above or underground, and there's really no reason to try to go out for lunch. 
when the only places to go are similarly complexes internal for the mega rich climate refugees who have luxury apartments, shopping and restaurants, all surrounded by physical and electronic barriers, including credit checks. As she passes another flashing screen with her late tuition balance, she sighs, maybe mom and dad are right. Maybe I should transfer out to the sneaker campus in the burbs. She's heard they have a program to work off tuition debt by committing to doing remote factory inspection for seven years after graduation. I've had my urban experience now, so maybe it's time to call it, she says. Or, 2072. <laughs> <Or. laughs> Tui leaves baby Sarie at the child care center on the ground floor of her dorm on the way to study group. This year, they're working together to learn more about drought resistant plant cultivation. A select elder shares about regional history, while Taiwo video links their sibling, Kehinde, in from Port Harcourt so everyone can learn more about water capture technology. Tui loves how each member of the group is a student and a teacher, bringing their knowledge of biology, engineering, nutrition, and horticulture together to learn and grow. They'll collaborate for six months or so before some folks go home to apply what they've learned and others move into new courses of study. As long as they're on campus, they'll have housing, wellness, childcare, and share meals, often from these community gardens. Tui's family lived nearby ever since her grandma had to leave her college because of nonstop fires in Southern California 40 years ago. Like many others, they ended up living where they could, right in the center of the city, transforming mostly vacant high rises into homes for the communities that were forged from the refugee experience. Tui feels right at home as she walks to meet her best friend for lunch just a few blocks away. Joe is wrapping up a yoga class at Liberation Square, Portland's living room, a class with access for anyone to join. As they enjoy their meal outdoors, Joe brings up her history class. They're studying the 2020s. Of course, I know about the first coronavirus pandemic, but did you know they used to leave people to sleep in the doorways around here? And this square, just anyone couldn't hang out. They had security guards with guns pushing people around. Toya and Joe, Joe contemplate how hard it is to picture it. It used to be that if you didn't pay for school, you get locked out of the library, Toya added. How could you stop someone from learning over money? When you get to the story of the debt uprising, let me know so I can sit in on class. The two friends link arms as they walk to pick up Sarayi for a stroll of, along the waterfront. Joe explains that she learned that the blossoms painted on the walkway awnings are cherry blossoms, representing trees that couldn't survive the hot temperatures of today, but are part of the shade now. As she continues chattering about everything she's learning, Toei thinks, I need to hug grandma. She is so tough as a Gen Z. I'm glad I was born in the 50s. So without belaboring the point, um, I, I think we really need to ask ourselves right now, where are we going to be as a university and a city if we simply let inertia take hold? Um, and where could we be if we were to try to project a vision that aligns more with the values that we claim? I want to thank uh, Sai and uh, Ethan for inviting me to participate. Uh, I like uh, being involved in the community, especially through students. Uh, and I strongly believe that Portland State has an important role to play in the region. So I appreciate being asked to participate in this. I thought I'd throw out that this is my <clears throat> 28th year here. And so I have a few more years before I catch up with Sai, but I've been around for a little bit. We've been asked to reflect on Kimberly and Ethan's paper and on PSU's role in the region in the future. I talk less about my vision and issues and more about how to get to that future. And perhaps Judith is right, there's a political side to my presentation. While this panel is meant at least in part to think about Coupa and how it can be engaged in the city going forward, the question about PSU's urban mission is bigger than the college and the comments I make are meant to be much broader. What does it mean to be an urban human adversity? Kimberly and Ethan provide a nice answer to that question. In the first part of their paper, they trace the development of urban universities, as Ethan talked about from the early part of the 20th century up to the present. At the end of this history, they identify five conditions that they say 
are associated with urban universities, three of them I think are particularly important for us to reflect upon. In brief, being an urban university means one, to be committed to providing urban residents with access to higher education. Two, to structure university practices so that they support an urban mission. And by this, they mean such things as hiring criteria, job incentives, and planning decisions. And three, to integrate urban community needs and aspirations into teaching, service, and research. The second half of the paper then provides a history of the development of Portland State's urban mission. This part of the paper does a good job in showing how Portland State has had a long commitment to being an urban university from its beginning up to the present. Kimberly and Ethan painted a positive picture of the ties between Portland State and the community over time. One of the high points of that the relationship was the recognition in the 1972 downtown plan of Portland's and Portland State's importance for the urban region. Another high point was the creation of the 1991 PSU strategic plan championed by Judith Rumeli which strongly asserted the university's urban mission and led to our model as I noted as let knowledge serve the city. A third high point came over the past 20 years or so in which to quote the authors, PSU's engagement through teaching, research and service blossom. As Kimberly and Ethan write, PSU is strongly engaged in the urban area today in all three of those areas. Looking at where we are today, we can say that every department in Coupa is engaged in local community and in the local community and region, as are the institutes and centers. But so are the other colleges and schools, be it social work, business, education, engineering, or fine arts. One of the most involved is university studies which offers some 220 capstones annually that send some 4,000 students into the community. We as a university are very engaged in the urban region. While the paper reveals a long positive relationship between the university and the urban region, it raises two particularly important challenges to this relationship. One of those challenges it acknowledges is the tension within the university between our urban mission and traditional university norms regarding research, publication, promotion, and other matters. Put simply, while the university may want to fulfill its urban mission, traditional university norms put a different set of pressures on faculty and others which work against this mission. For example, the university has frequently talked about expanding the definition of scholarship to encourage more engagement but departments still want to look at scholarly publications to make tenure and promotion decisions. This is certainly true in my own department within political science. The other challenge the paper raises, but leaves open for interpretation, is the fact that Portland's most recent Central City 2035 plan made barely any mention whatsoever of the university. The authors write that this could be due to the changing nature of planning, but they also raise the possibility that there may have been a change in fundamental relationships between the university and the region. If we were to think strategically about PSU's future as an urban university, we have to think about those two challenges. Overcoming the tension between our urban mission and traditional university norms may not be possible. Instead though, we might think about ways to work within that tension so that the university can fulfill the mission as best as possible. Perhaps the best way to approach this tension is for the university to take time to think about how as an institution, we can better serve the community. Today, the university office seems more concerned about counting enrollment and other internal measures in making programmatic decisions rather than reflecting on the value of what we can do to better meet the needs of the community, both in attracting students and in serving the city. Broader conversation can be the seed for smarter growth, one that thrives within that tension. 
While we can talk about a blossoming of PSU's engagement in the community, this blossoming has been coming from individual faculty members and programs, and not, in a sense, the university itself. It's not been a coordinated effort. The last time the university made a strong statement about our urban mission was in that 1991 strategic plan. This is not to say the university leadership is, not, is unconcerned about this mission, but it just seems that other types of issues have taken priority since then. We've had broad conversations previously at Portland State about our future. Some 15 years ago, we had a conversation about our strengths and how we could build on those strengths to improve the university. It was that conversation that led to a university-wide focus on sustainability, which included the hiring of new faculty with expertise in sustainability to make sure we built on that strength. In thinking about our long-term involvement in the urban region and in overcoming this challenge, the university should hold a similar conversation. One that focuses broadly on our strengths and what we can do to better serve the city and the region. While we may not be able to overcome the tension between traditional academic norms and our urban mission, we can encourage program development and employment decision in areas that strengthen our urban mission, which will make it easier for faculty both to meet traditional academic requirements, yet also serve the urban community. Ideally, by focusing greater attention on how we better serve the community, it will not only help us remain involved in providing professional support to the region, but also helps us consider how well we are meeting the educational needs of urban residents, rather than just cutting programs based on current enrollment or trying to increase enrollment by lowering admission criteria. The other challenge raised in the paper is the possibility that there's been a change in fundamental relationships between PSU and the region. I took some time in the presenting this paper to contact some people I know uh, in leadership positions in the urban area. And from talking to a few of them, there's a sense among some that Portland State has not been stepping up to the plate strong enough in playing a leadership role in the community. Certainly, uh, my, uh, this is not a large sample, uh, but with whom I spoke, but it is consistent with the comment raised in the paper. Yes, we have many faculty members, students, and programs that are tied into things throughout the urban region. But the sense among some in the community is that the leadership of the university has not been working enough with community leaders to ensure that PSU has a strong relationship with the, the region. Maybe the thing that leadership hasn't been doing enough is not a fair statement. I'm, really, I'm sure actually all of our presence have, are, have been engaged with the community and are concerned about the community. Perhaps a more precise way to say it is that the university could use a more united front in ensuring that we have a strong force in the community, one which is not left out of a future central city plan and similar documents. What can the university leadership to do to step up to the plate and for us to provide a more unified front? I don't have all the answers to that question. I think this needs to be part of our conversation too. But at a minimum, it means doing all we can to make a concerted, overt, and ongoing effort to remind community leaders and the community in general that we are here. To make it a priority for our next president and those presidents who follow to engage actively and continuously with a wide range of community leaders. To bring community leaders to PSU for dialogues and important issues confronting the region and to demonstrate a sincere commitment to continuing our urban mission. I mentioned this word about sincere commitment uh, because I was talking to the leaders in the arts community a couple of years ago while creating a new class on arts policy. Some of them expressed mm -hmm. distrust of Portland State. Uh, that dates back to the disbanding of the university's dance department some 20 years ago. Let knowledge serve the city needs to be more than a nice slogan. It needs to be a sincere, unified, leadership-led commitment. What this means is that as PSU is going to play an effective role in addressing the challenges that face the city and region over the next 50 years, it needs to think first about itself, take coordinated steps to strengthen our resources in those areas, 
and then make a more prominent leadership led effort to engage the community. I might add, I think uh, this series of panels put on by Cooper is a good starting point for this conversation. So it's one of these types of conversations that I think needs to go way beyond Cooper and engage the entire university uh, <laughs> community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, please talk amongst yourselves. Well, I have to take up the president's search committee. What else do you think our president, future president, would need to know about us in order to represent and act in ways that you just described, Richard. I just you gave a wonderful description. Right. Tell, tell us more. Tell us more. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I don't have all the. I mean, I wish I had all the answers. I'm sure I probably somewhere have lots of answers that I could share with you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, some of it I think is just. Some of it I think is marketing. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, not entirely, but to a certain extent, maybe it's from conversations with my wife who does professional PR work. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, sometimes I don't think we're just simply as visible in the community as me might, might want. I mean, it's just a really simple little example. And again, it gets back to the fact I've been involved in, in, the, in looking into the arts more. Did you know at Lincoln Hall we have uh, um, some 350 arts presentations a year? Of oh, so performances, 350. And some of those come out of the university, but some of those are local arts organizations that are making performances there. But we none of us know it. You know, um, uh, Dean Bynum has asked to put up a, uh, um, a marquee up there so we can let the public know that we are actively engaged here in the arts community. But, uh, you know, the university has other priorities to come first. It would require a, a zoning change and some other things, but it's a little thing. Mm -hmm. And like that, uh, mm -hmm. that that reach out to your community and tell tell them there. Uh, um, I was talking to a former department chair about our efforts in our department to reach out into the community and uh, and 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 try to get more more people to come to our program to PSU. And he said that he felt that uh, uh, that we were in it alone. Uh, that there wasn't a concerted effort, and it wasn't much help from the university to to, to do a concerted effort to reach out. Even on a smaller level, for years, um, I like to go to the Mexicano, the, the Mexican American Festival that's in uh, yeah. uh, Woodburn every year. And you know, Western, uh, Western, uh, uh, Washington, uh, Western Oregon State University has a, a table there. Oregon State University there, but I've never seen a Portland State University there. Yet that's in the heart of the Latino, uh, it's very part of the Latino community in Oregon. And why aren't we there? And so, uh, so I mean. I, I, I don't know if there we have financial priorities place other different places, but uh, um, I, I, uh, or just uh, these are simply overlooked or just what, but I mean, these are certain types of things I think the university ought to be doing. Thank you. Yeah, I think what really resonated for me, um, Richard, and what you were saying is that individual people and individual programs are very present in the space but that's not the same as the institution being present in the space. And it's very, actually very confusing for people in the community about what any one of our individual presence means when we show up to something. Is this the university showing up? Is this you as a rogue actor showing up? Like what, can we understand this? Um, and I've definitely seen that um, over, I mean, not just in this very recent conversation about the, about um, the houselessness and the sort of crisis on the streets, but in a longer period of time around housing. Um, I've worked on a number of projects around um, expanding housing access, particularly around transit, um, in which, you know, I'm sitting in meetings of the Southwest Corridor light rail expansion and could not get Portland State University as the, you know, one of the two major employers um, on the new uh, line that's going down the orange line, um, but also the other, the other direction. So the, the orange line, but then there's a new light rail that's being planned to go down into, into Tigard um, to talk about housing mm -hmm. as an institution that we ought to show up and say, yeah. our students, our staff need, desperately need housing that they can afford either near campus or on the light rail at new 
buildings that would be developed and yes, I'm there. And so people think, oh, PSU. Well, no, I'm here to do a research project with community partners. I'm not here to, you know, weigh in as the full weight of Portland State University with transit agencies, regional government, et cetera. And I've seen that happen sort of repeatedly. And it's, you know, particularly painful when it's in my own area, area of interest. I've watched us, um, you know, address student transportation problems by saying it would be easier for students to take PSU credit classes at the outlying community colleges, rather than try to work to get better transit passes, you know, for our students who want to come here and want to come downtown and work on things. So it does seem like we're not, um, as Portland State, as an institution, as 19% of downtown yeah. uh, showing up at 19% mm -hmm. of power. It's hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good point. So we're there, but we're not there. But we bet the fix that. <laughs> you know, Lisa, I'm curious. Um, your approach was a story to absolutely spot on clear stories, very different futures. Part of what I've wondered about is, do we need more storytelling? Because we tend to approach problems through the again, lenses. I keep thinking lenses because those glasses. <laughs> 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 I think I have my I professional mean, air boy, to my conversation air. I mean, wow. I mean, it's changed my metaphors <laughs> all day. But anyway, and just when we approach with a particular idea of what the boundaries of improvement are, when we look at it as a political scientist, in my case, a biologist, we're missing something. But a story breaks that thing. So yeah. do you do this more often? Do you see it as a way we could begin to respond to this? Yeah, I mean, I. I very much do. I want, I think that I make a distinction between the kind of visionary world building practice that really asks questions about where we are and where we want to go um, versus the kinds of, like, I think PSU does do storytelling in the sense of marketing and PR. I, you know, you, if you go to the alum, the you know, big fundraising dinners or graduation. There's some really wonderful mm -hmm. stories of student, you know, uh, students' lives. I mean, they're very moving. I don't want to take away from them. They're really wonderful. You know, I would sit in my house when we had no commencement for two years, like crying because I've loved <laughs> commencement so yes. much. And I've watched the, all the little videos that they've made about all the students, you know, triumphing. Genuinely, I'm a real, um, I'm a real like mush for commencement. But, um, but you know, I think, so I think there's like a date in storytelling. We don't want to just gloss over things, but like, how can we tell stories about ourselves and where we want to go that are really grappling with what's going on? So as we have faced in the past couple of years, this kind of looming student credit hours, you know, disaster, like that's what I've really encouraged us to think about in Coupa and in our units is like, can we put the spreadsheet aside for a moment and talk about the story of what it is that we are doing and where what we want to be doing and where we want to be going and use that to actually, you know, think about very concretely what we need to do right now. Um, and I think what becomes um, really apparent in that is how far away our aspirations and our values are. The things that we do in our our spare time with like our duct tape and our paper clips that really feed our souls that really do have high impact for community that really energize our students are actually really not seen or felt or measured in the ways that um, the university can recognize and account for. Um, and so that's been, I mean, that's like a kind of a bummer, right? You're work, doing this yes. work to try to, to try to, to 
create these ideas and these ideals that you have and then sort of seeing the the disconnect there um, becomes much more stark and so i do think about how how do we bring these values and these activities into the institution as as like things on the to-do list but also you know things on the on the you know toting up what we did um because i don't think we're doing a great job with that right now <laughs> well clear look right there there that's underneath what you get said that i'm hearing is we use quantitative measures to assess impact when in fact the real changes are learn more about yourself or situation appreciating what your own strengths are what you want to know and so I doubt that you can just off the top of your head to test a total solution to that problem. But no. if there's <laughs> if there's anyone who's thinking about it, it's both of you. And is there a way to think about how to judge our own selves more gracefully? I mean, I have, right. <laughs> I mean, I have some very like spreadsheety ideas. I, oh, dear. I'll say that um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. That's not what I, 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 I actually genuinely really believe that these are, like, we can get in a virtual cycle here. I think that the more things that we do and say and recognize about um, our real deep commitments to place and to people in this place um, and the real work that we do and the impact that we have, that it will, it will if we're able to communicate it, if we're able to have the table at the festival uh, and, and talk to, stu to prospective students about it, that we will also generate more people coming. Like, I would love to have more student credit hours in my class because I think everything I say is like real smart and important and that they want to know it and that they should know it, of course, right? But also I want to hear what they have to say. You know, I am, yes. right? It's like, I'm ecstatic to be in the classroom and hear what my students are thinking about everything that's happening in the world right now and get their perspective and learn from them as well. Um, and so I, I believe that the more that we can tell people about what's happening in our spaces, that the more people will obviously want to show up to be in them because they are exciting and generative and creative. Um, and as you said, they're problem solving and they're interdisciplinary and they're they're really grappling with the things that are happening that we all care about so much in our everyday lives. I yep. really, really believe that. Um, I think, you know, one like immediate thing that I respond to is a very like bureaucratic problem is that um, boundaries, the boundaries that we make inside the university are totally fictional. If we are doing interdisciplinary work to address wicked problems, um, why would we account for cash flows to old, ancient, like medieval, put our robes on <laughs> circles Sorry. that we draw around people, you know, in different disciplines and areas and say, that's your money and that's your money and that's your money and that's how we account for everything. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then we get, we spend a lot of time like chasing that conversation instead of thinking about what is it that we're actually doing here together in the world? How are we actually making a difference? What's good? Departments are fake. Colleges are pretend. We made these up. <laughs> well, darn it. Yes, we did. A hundred years ago. You're right. The disciplines emerged in the primordial ooze in the 1830s and 40s. Right. Knowing our history as an entity can be quite helpful. But I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, you, you've just captured the core problem, which is how we look at the world. And so as long as we have disciplines, as long as we have colleges, as long as we have hierarchies, all of which play an important role in keeping our stuff in order. But don't do what you're describing, which is with heart and soul connect. What do you think? Um, I think uh, storytelling is great, actually, uh, for a variety of assorted reasons. Uh, 
Um, you know, we often think of elected officials as just wanting to be given the data, and they really often don't care about the data. Uh, they want to be told stories. They want to know how a particular public policy affects people uh, directly, their constituents and others. So maybe hand a machine that has some data on it, but the rest of the time they want to hear about, about people. I also do think we, we all have great stories. And, and I like to share you know, stories of where our students are at. And, the, and, and, and I, I, I sometimes wonder how well those stories reach out into our, our community. You know, a number of years ago, the university had all these posters around campus of faculty members and what they're, what they're doing and their specialties and expertise. And I thought, why aren't these not students? It'd be nice to have these things out in the community that say, you know, our students are here and this is their story. Uh, have them in posters in social science and humanities classrooms in the high schools are saying, you know, here's uh, where, where you can be someday, uh, you know, if you continue on through higher education and get our, our stories out yep. uh, into the, the community so they, uh, they know we're here and also uh, that there's a, a promising future for them. Uh, and I think it not only then connects with people, but again, also with elected officials. Oh, it also affects how we think about ourselves yes. if we do that. Okay. Yeah. Shall we open it up? Yep. So please, colleagues here in the room, colleagues zooming in, questions, comments? Yes, please identify yourself, please. Hi, my name is Um I think listening to all of this, Local governments, and you have specialist disciplines, the whole school sector is functioning without the government, which doesn't help us as much as elementary schools don't as well. So, we, we want our students to go to higher ed. So, how can we create even greater leadership from the government as well? Um, You know, that's a topic I struggled with throughout my career, which is how do you go from preschool all the way to graduate school? And it's not just paths between them, it's how does each group inform and interact with the others? So many years ago, for instance, our undergraduates who were in an area that had to do with what to do with waste and that would be more sustainable. Students in undergraduate worked with high school students who mentored middle school students because those age differences meant that rather than a teacher telling you to make sure you put your cup in a recycling bin, that there was a growing network of people. So I think part of the answer to your question that would come to mind for me is finding ways for our community's young people to teach us and each other sort of picking up these on what you said about you want to hear from your students because they're they're not just there with their little brains open to you or your wisdom into even though you have a lot of wisdom. So that's most of the efforts I know about over the years have involved some kind of formal way in which the president of the university meets with the commissioner of education and so on. And I'm thinking the urban university model can be to build this network of people, which begins to open up entirely new set 
of imagination and possibility when you don't just have leaders trying to solve problems. I didn't answer your question, but I answered my own question instead. Ethan. Yes. Uh, hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, fantastic uh, kind of comments uh, across the board. Um, one thing I forgot to say is that though the Urban University mission is baked into Portland State's history, it's and, and really in many ways has been our superpower. Um, it's not um, it's not safe. It's not kind of enough just to kind of be there. Uh, there have been times uh, in the past when, um, you know, the very existence of Portland State has been questioned and it will be questioned again. And all of this to say that um, we've got to have a, a better understanding of our brand and of our mission um, if we're going to kind of come up with a, a kind of a, a better response to the conditions that we're in um, or a one that is in fact sufficient uh, to kind of fend off the attacks we're going to probably get in the future about our very existence. Um, we're not going to be able to re-envision our way uh, through our business practices, I guess, is what I'm really saying, and uh, would really hope that the next president remembers uh, or knows or acts on uh, the need to actively steward this urban university brand, because it is by no means secure. Shall I do a treatise or a quick <laughs> response? You're talking to the chair of the governance committee, and that's what I think about every day. I give you a couple of answers. The process of looking for our next president has opened up both within the trustee leadership in particular but also the listening sessions we've had this week with people across the campus who play different roles here. Um, it's a means to think about what matters most. The role of the court is to hire a lightweight and hopefully not have to fire the president of the and the actual creation of community is a shared responsibility with everyone, partly because of the newness of the board. We were only established in 
2014, partly due to the incredible destruction of the, of the pandemic of the three years. And I think about it. I'm sitting here with people and I'm not wearing a mask. I'm scared. But I'm doing it anyway, you know, because we're still in that state. As a result, the board doesn't appear to be part of the community. In fact, most people simply look at it as something up in the sky with a dark lightning, not a silver one that's probably doing things that will disturb your peace. But what we're doing is we're opening that up through just the conversations about what we're looking for. The search consultants will give us a report on what they heard. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, this fall, there will be a series of conversations led by three important state people. Uh, the leader in Sticky right now, our, our former uh, presiding officer is actually saying, on what we've learned from the pandemic and what that means for our future. And that group, I didn't bring the name, but it's sort of our people, our place, that kind of the title, have invited all the trustees to consider attending one of those sessions. Now, if that happens, not only could the trustee talk about what, what led them to want to be on the board, what inspires them about Portland State, what, what they've learned in their own sphere from the pandemic. How any of us will participate, I don't know. But there are five trustees on the search committee, and all of us listen to one or more of those listening sessions. So the, the challenge is to recognize that we are part of the community, that governance doesn't mean we control the community. It means we need to have a similar understanding of Portland State today that you have, or the faculty senate has, or the student association, or the unions. There are all sorts of groups that represent big chunks of Portland State. We don't live on the same planet. And so my hope is to begin to see things through different back to lenses, different lenses. I mean, it, a conversation like this one is setting off all kinds of things in my own head, as they obviously have done yours. Sorry for the long answer. But <laughs> I hope that the, I mean, I think one thing that's really, it's really challenging for me to imagine how the trustees would facilitate or lead a process if they are not themselves aware of, for example, the things in the paper. I hope Ethan, I hope you decided the trustees <laughs> your paper. Um, good point. I don't know. We don't have very good ways to communicate the word of of trustees we'll, we'll fix directly that. it's actually quite challenging to um communicate to the board of trustees but mm -hmm. um i hope that they would you know read this paper and learn all these things yeah. um that there would be an extensive and robust onboarding process of understanding you know the values and identities of portland state for people coming on to the board of trustees i'll say my my exclusive encounters with trustees was around the murder of Jason Washington by campus police. Oh, that was not um, good. Yeah. And it was talking to a group of people who appeared to be not fully aware of what they were doing. That being a trustee of the university is not like being on the board at the symphony or a nonprofit. Right. Like we work here, people live here, we have, you know, we're we're learning and teaching here. You know, we're there, it, it's like it's more like being the city council of a small town right it's tens of thousands of people and 
Mm -hmm. there seemed to be like a real disconnect even from that to start what is a university and what are we doing let alone this much deeper connection and, and mission and history of the way that this university is is embedded in and of this place and how we ought to be connected with this place and so i feel like there actually needs to be some ground up you know teaching and educating and coming together um for folks as they come on to that board well, you're going to have an invitation to come to the government. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an idle point. Uh, it, part of what you're saying at the time, for instance, of Chase Washington, and the board didn't have any on board. We do now. And I will make sure that when we welcome our five new trustees properly, which we couldn't do ahead of our meetings this month because they were appointed just before the meetings. But I'll make sure that they have a copy of, or that they received a copy of Ethan's, of, or Ethan and Nightingale Kimberly um, paper. But, the, the really important thing is developing this shared appreciation so that the actions in shared governance, the actions of the faculty take, the students take, the board takes, all are built on similar appreciation and understanding. As all of our board comes from Portland too. We're not one of those boards that applies to people in from Washington, D.C. So or I picked that because the other board I was on did that. And that person always looked like a deer in the head, like, where am I? <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate your asking the question. I would welcome, as Lisa just said, any thoughts you have needed to have on what you wish the board would learn, how would they acquire a deeper appreciation for the deep culture of this place? Uh, it would be helpful. And certainly in the governance committee, which is where this needs to start, having it. I've never thought of it just now. I mean, I've invited the something officer of the Texas and the president of the Students Association to attend, but I hadn't thought through inviting others just to talk about the university as they experience it, which is why I'm walking away from this conversation with an aha, and I like those things, so I should be up to mischief under the back. Well, I did mail a copy of the paper to trustees at pdx.edu. So I hope. Well, they don't usually look at pdx.edu. <laughs> That's an important issue. Before <laughs> Sheila, is there an online question we should move toward? No. Okay, Sheila. I um, really appreciate everybody's comments here. I, I enjoyed reading the paper um, a while back and thinking about it and had a chance to talk about it. Um, and, you know, Lisa, I really appreciated your point about, you know, sort of engagement being something that a lot of people feel like they do in their spare time. And it, it reminds me a lot about when people have a job that they hate, but then they do the things they love in their, in their spare time. Uh, it, after all, you have to eat, right? So we need to do the things we need to do to bring students in. But your point about, you know, being able to distinguish PSU as an engaged university and being able to use that as a recruitment for faculty as well as students is really important. And this conversation about engagement being um, a factor in promotion of teacher guidelines is a national conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the books being written about it right now, um, yeah. like Andrew Hoffman, the New Age Scholar, and there's discussions about this happening everywhere. Every university is struggling with this problem of 
faculty wanting to do engaged work, but most of the time maybe not knowing how to evaluate it. The University of Minnesota, both a land grant and urban university, has been um, really active in publishing um, guidelines for promotion and tenure for engaged scholarship. And, and, and there are more examples out there. And so I think Portland State actually has an opportunity to sort of being a leader and figuring this out and saying our identity is around how we engage with our community and we expect our faculty to demonstrate that. And if you come here and do this work, you will be rewarded. And that's how we Anyway, um, that's how Portland State establishes its identity and compete um, and live off of that identity. And that's by, you know, attracting students here and faculty here who want to do that. So, so do you mm -hmm. think that that is a good illustration of what's back? Well, may I, a, co a brief comment here? I think we made a major step in that direction when Judith was president and the university promotion and tenure guidelines were revised in 1996 to include the scholarship of outreach. I thought that was a major move just in the direction that you outlined, distinguishing between outreach and service and making outreach one of the three key categories when it comes time to promotion and tenure review. So implementation of that is still a work in That's progress. But in terms of getting things on paper and approved, Faculty Senate Office of Academic Affairs, mm -hmm. as part of implementing their strategic plan and the various dimensions of it, changing promotion and tenure guidelines that way, I think was a major innovation. It, it was in, in ways, but you know, I mean, watch witnessing it going through political science, it was just sort of viewed as an add on. Yeah, just as uh, uh, Sheila mentioned, uh, uh, I, mean, I actually think more for people who get promoted to full professor, it's taken more seriously that there's a recognition that uh, uh, community engagement is one of the things you can do. But for getting uh, tenured, uh, yeah, um, it, it's good you do that, but we still want you to do, you know, uh, no, we've actually increased our publication uh, requirements since then. Uh, and so we have a higher publication requirement and uh, you might take that into consideration. So I think it's, uh, um, and I think it was sort of viewed at the time by some, it's okay, well, we're at this on, but it's, uh, we still want you to, you know, do traditional scholarship. You sit out, you know, we have to do reviews with that external reviewers and, you know, they routinely come back and said, you know, at our institution, this would not be enough. <clears throat> this would be enough uh, to get you tenure. And so they still also, of course, from their perspective, add uh, interpretations for our people coming up based upon uh, interpretations of other universities. So it is a, a, a difficult challenge to overcome. A lot of universities are providing their external reviewers that context of um, that, that this is something that we are trying to encourage in our right. faculty and we're trying to be aware of. But that doesn't mean they listen to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I am, I'm having like a terrible flashback to reading that exact line in my own <laughs> um, reviews, external reviews, and I know that like, all those people were provided with our with our guidelines. Um, I think that there is also a challenge as a, so I came here in part in the main part really to leave a R1 environment in which engagement was an extra add-on and please go back and office and close the door um and you know yeah i like came to the interview and i got to have lunch with Cy adler and all that was nice but i really read the pnt guidelines to determine whether or not i could take a job here um and be happy but they're very unevenly applied across the university in terms of how much they're valued i really again i see this all as being very interlinked with these questions about um you know the enrollment and engagement with is that like being a dinosaur in the disciplines the traditional disciplines of only traditional academic publication i just really believe that is like you are a t-rex watching an asteroid coming at you that is not 
what we need in the world anymore. We need people, and it's not just because student, you know, we should have a customer orientation to students. They want to do fun stuff. It's not that. It's like we really want to do real things in the world. We really want to take education and and activate with them. And I, that doesn't mean just doing applied, you know, work like fixing the housing problem. It's also reading literature, making art, and doing all the things that make us better humans, more human humans in the world. Um, but I, I totally agree. I, I think that for PSU to be a model, to, one, to evenly apply this within our own university. So the units that are doing a, a great job of rewarding engagement and scholarship to help the units that are um, not doing a great job with that. And then I think it's also about recruiting and choosing faculty who want that for their life. I mean, I really came here because I wanted that. And I that meant very consciously rejecting and setting aside a different reward system and a reward system that is what I have was trained and educated to react to. It was those gold stars. And I had to choose to reorient myself um, as an ego um, and in a career way toward a different set of rewards. And I think we have to be really clear about that if we want people to come and do that work that um, whatever happened to you at your PhD program, this is a different, we're looking for something different. I think we will attract amazing people who are looking for that and want to fully integrate that um, into themselves so that it's not a job I hate, it's something I do on the side, but it's everything that I love and I'm passionate about and that is my calling I get to do in, in all the aspects of my life. Then you have no work-life balance, but that's a totally different issue. <laughs> <laughs> May I add a little more to this to uh, you know um so I run our internship program since I've been here and I've been running internship programs since uh, I was a grad student to, and I, I really like it I love having my students out in the community and really it's always for years was just an add-on it's just I happen to like doing it and uh, I do it at some point I did figure out a way when I was division chair to uh, turn it into regular class but then eventually I found doing it as a capstone uh, at least that's a way in which I've been able to um, to do what I want to do within the community, uh, and yet, in a sense, uh, I then did this added into my course load. Uh, so there's at least some sort of bit of overlap there. Maybe that's some one way to approach things too, is uh, through through classroom uh, uh, involvement, uh, uh, figuring out how we can engage that way too. So. Um, we have something else. Era, C E R A. Uh, indeed. Age Research Academy, which I happily manage. Uh, we figured out some of this listening to people. And so this year's RFP focused on new ways to assess the impact of community engagement in its various forms. And we'll issue, uh, just an issue, another RFP for 2023 that repeats it because it's going to take some time. But the value of that is, and that they're picking up with uh, what you said earlier, is it will offer ways for faculty to show the impact of their work in hopefully uh, to replace the usual criteria of which journals I appeared in and who cites my work. Uh, so it's a slow process change, it's gonna take a while, but I think we'll keep at it for a couple more years because if we had those measures, it would be good. I, my last point is I have a sense talking to colleagues at other institutions that a lot of the traditional research universities are attracting people to their doctoral programs like you, uh, Lisa, want to apply what they know in a good way, in an engaged way. So, that may help too, because a lot of the reason why we don't properly evaluate uh, these activities is 
the senior people in our departments group up in a different era. It looks, are we out of time? I had that feet. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you very, very much to the panel. Ethan, thank you. Best wishes for your immediate complete recovery. Next one in the series will be a week from today, October 13. <clears throat> and it's going to be about community engaged research. And Judith Romaley will be the moderator of that panel. So thank you very, very much for coming, whether it's virtually or in person. And the whole idea is to keep this conversation going. There isn't anything I think more important, especially in the context of a search for a new president and other challenges as we know uh, looming ahead to think about and talk about these issues. Thank you all very much. Thank you.